in the heart of a bustling office where the click clack of keyboards sinks the anthem of productivity we find mark the beleaguered yet dashing hero of our tale his office an elegant bastion amidst the chaos is a reflection of the man himself organized stylish but with a few papers astray hinting at the storm beneath the calm enter ben mark's longtime friend and the office's unofficial purveyor of news both good and bad mostly entertaining with the grace of a broadway star making an entrance ben strides into mark's office a mischievous glint in his eye ready to stir the pot mark my man ben announces with a flourish as if he's about to reveal the secrets of the universe rather than indulge in office gossip i heard through the grapevine which in this case is just linda from accounting that you got yourself a new secretary do tell is the rumor mill churning out truth this time or is it just full of hot hair as usual mark looks up from his fortress of paperwork a half amused half resigned smile playing on his lips it's a smile that knows the battles of office politics all too well and has learned to find humor in its absurdities then you are like a walking talking tablet mark retorts leaning back in his chair the very image of a man who's seen it all and then some but yes the rumors are true for once i have hired a new secretary seems like the world is indeed coming to an end ben laughs a hearty sound that fills the room and momentarily pushes back the walls of monotony that tend to close in around office life well congratulations and in order then with a final chuckle ben left leaving mark to ponder the truth in his friend's theatrical musings in the bustling heart of the office where whispers of productivity meld with the clack of keyboards lucy the new secretary transform a curiosity into a covert mission positioned strategically by the water cooler a casual stance belies the keen mind at work plotting a next move in the intricate dance of office politics she is a modern day explorer navigating the uncharted territories of workplace dynamics a site set on the most intriguing of all mysteries our boss mark richardson with the stage of a seasoned detective lucy approaches betty the unofficial keeper of office law a inquiry wrapped in the guise of innocent curiosity betty she begins a voice a blend of intrigue and nonchalance i have heard tales of mr mark's legendary coffee addiction is it true that he can outdrink the espresso machine betty caught between amusement and the thrill of gossip leans in a voice dropping to a conspirator Victoria whisper Oh Lucy it is not just the coffee did you know is Serenes is plant with jazz to help them grow their laughter fills the space a light moment in the daily grind yet beneath the banter Lucy's mind races piercing together the puzzle of Mark Richardson she imagines him a coffee connoisseur with a green tomb a man of unexpected layers just waiting to be discovered with each tidbit of information a plan takes shape a strategy designed to navigate the complexities of our enigmatic boss 
In this game of chess, Lucy positions herself as a queen ready to make her move, armed with the power of knowledge and the element of surprise. Ben enters into Mark's office. The air is thick with anticipation as Mark draped over his chair like a garment left to dry, skeptically eyes his friend. Ben, leaning against the door frame with the casual ease of a cowboy at a saloon, launches into his advice. Mark, he begins, his voice carrying the gravitas of a late night talk show host about to reveal life's secret. In times of trouble, you need to talk to God. The Bible says in Psalm 50 and verse 5, and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. You can always tell God about your troubles. Also, you can book sessions for counseling and anger management. It will help you a lot. Mark races and hybrid his skepticism if it, as visible as the coffee stains on his desk. Prayers, counseling and anger management, he echoes his tone laced with doubt as if Ben had suggested consulting the weather for stock tips. Ben notes solemnly undeterred by Mark's incredulity. Yes, my friend, it is time to seek divine intervention. You are right in a way, Mark said. I will look into it. Great, Ben replied. As the scene closes, Mark's office seems less a cage of obligations and more a launch pad for spiritual exploration. Ben, the unexpected guru, exists with the satisfaction of a man who's just prescribed chicken soup for the soul. And Mark, alone amidst the echoes of Ben's advice, contemplates a connection beyond Wi-Fi signals, wondering if the answers to his troubles lie not in emails but in whispers to the heavens. Lucy, the new secretary with aspirations higher than the tallest skyscraper, stands by the water cooler. It's no test that brings her here, but a test of different kind. She's observed Mark, her boss, from the corners of her eyes noting a size heavier than the office air conditioning could cool. With a skimming sparkle in her eye, Lucy leans against the water cooler, acting out a version of a Shakespearean aside. Ah, Mark, she muses, loud enough for Betty, the next Dex neighbor and unofficial office gossip historian to overhear a man of mystery cloaked in business casual and the faint aroma of premium coffee is at a fortress a secretary's deck the drawbridge to conquer the fortress she dramatically pauses checking to ensure her audience is hooked one must become the drawbridge betty Caught between rolling her eyes and genuine curiosity, decides to play along. And how does one become a drawbridge? Oh, wise Lucy. Lucy, with the confidence of a cat walking on a sunny windowsill, outlines a grand plan. By becoming indispensable, dear Betty. By being the morning coffee he did not know he needed, the sorted emails that brighten his day, 
and the schedule so perfectly managed he finds himself with time to ponder the deeper meanings of us. Betty chuckles. You make it sound like a medieval quest. Losing straight things. Our tone taking on the cadence of an epic narrator. Indeed, for love is the greatest adventure, and I, Lucy, shall be its most daring explorer. I will chart the unexplored territories of Max Art, dodge the dragons of office protocol, and emerge victorious. Is art claimed and my future secured? The water cooler, if it could, will have sighed at the unfolding drama, serving not just as a dispenser of refreshment but as a witness to the birth of Lucy's grand romantic and slightly delusional quest. Betty, now thoroughly entertained, decides Lucy's antics might just be the highlight of her day. Well then, Lady Lucy. May your quest be fruitful and your coffee never bitter. As Lucy walks away, her steps light with plotting, she misses the bemused shake of the head from Betty, who mutters to herself, This is going to be more entertaining than the season final of the office. Thus, the stage is set, the characters poised for action, and in the wings, Faith waits with bated breath to see how Lucy's master plan will unfold in the sprawling saga of office romance. In the sanctum of Mark's office, cluttered with the relics of business battles and the spoils of corporate victories, the atmosphere was charged with a different kind of tension. Here, amidst the skyscrapers of foul stacks and the labyrinth of paperwork, Mark, the beleaguered hero of our tale, sat across from Ben, a sage like confidant, looking more like a man on trial than a captain of industry. Ben, with the hiss of a man, who had weathered many storms, both in boardrooms and bars, leaned back, his chair creaking like the mast of a ship braving the high seas. So he began his tone as smooth as aged whiskey. The mighty Mark is besieged by woes of the heart. Mark's response was a heavy sigh, one that seemed to carry the weight of the world or at least the weight of fractured love life. It's like navigating through a storm without a compass, he confessed, running a hand through his ear in a gesture of defeat. The flicker of amusement in Ben's eyes softened into genuine concern. You need to anchor yourself, my friend. And sometimes the best anchor is faith, he advised, his voice tinged with the wisdom of one who had found solace in unseen abos. Mark's choku was short and devoid of humor. Faith, I'm not even sure which direction to pray in. Does not matter, Ben countered with a shrug, as casual as Eve he were discussing the weather. Just send your words up. God has excellent reception. In that clustered office, a moment of levity pierced the gloom. Mark, for the first time in a long while, cracked a genuine smile, however flicting. Perhaps in the grand tapestry of life's trials, a little faith and a good friend were the only compass one needed. Lucy made her entry into the office on a Monday morning, her arrival eroded not by fanfares or drum rolls, 
but by the accidental symphony of her dropping a stack of files right at Mark's doorway. It was as if the universe itself wanted to spotlight her debut, albeit in the most comical, clumsy way imaginable. Good morning, sir. Lucy chirped, her voice a mixture of enthusiasm and a barely conceived panic as she tried to gather the scattered documents. Her hands moved in a blur, as if she were trying to perform a magic trick that would make the mess disappear. Mark, on the other hand, stood frozen, caught between the desire to help and the instinct to retreat to the safety of his coffee mug. The scene could have been lifted straight from a sitcom about office life, complete with a laugh track for Lucy's mishap. I hope your day is going less chaotically than mine, she managed to say, finally standing up straight, I face the color of the ripest tomato. Mark couldn't help but let out a gentle laugh, the tension in the hair dissipating like mist in the morning sun. Welcome to the team, Lucy. Let's just hope your filing is neater than your entrance. He equipped, the corner of his lips turning up in a smile that was both amused and sympathetic. Lucy nodded. Her initial embarrassment fading into a determined grin. You won't be disappointed, sir. I am much better at organizing files than I am at juggling them. She promised, her spirit undimmed by the rocky start. As she finally made her way to her desk, leaving behind a slightly bemused mark, it was clear that Lucy's introduction to the office was anything but ordinary. But then again, in the world of nine to fives and endless paperwork, it was this moment of unexpected hilarity that kept the spirit of camaraderie alive. Under the soft glow of his bedroom lamp, Mark found himself leaning an unusual posture for a man more accustomed to the rigidity of office chairs than the humility of prayer. The room was silent, save for the quiet home of the city that never sleeps, a stark contrast to the tumult within Mark's heart. Father, in the name of Jesus, Mark began, his voice shaky betraying the firmness he was known for. I have made a mess of things, he admitted, his words floating up towards the ceiling as if the plaster and paint could ferry them to the heavens. He paused, his mind racing through the litany of wrongs he wished to write, the apologies he longed to make. I took matters into my own hands, and I sent my wife away. The confession hung heavy in the hair, a tangible reminder of the rift he had created. With a sigh that seemed to carry the weight of his regrets, Mark continued, Lord, please forgive me. I am sorry. It was a plea for mercy for a chance to mend the broken pieces of his life. He spoke of his wife, of the love lost and the space between them now filled with silence. I pray, Lord, that you touch her heart, grant her the grace to forgive me. His voice wavered, a mix of hope and despair. Mark's prayer was not just a series of requests, it was a journey, a testament to the power of faith and the belief in second chances. 
your word says ask and it shall be given unto you seek and you will find knock and the door will be open to you he clung to these words a lifeline in the storm he had conjured as he concluded his prayer there was a sense of peace a calm that enveloped him like a gentle embrace thank you lord he whispered a simple yet profound expression of gratitude rising from the floor mark's silhouette was cast in a halo of lamp light a man transformed by the act of surrendering to a higher power it was a moment of vulnerability of strength found in the acknowledgement of weakness and a testament to the enduring hope that faith could indeed move mountains or at the very least bridge the gap between two estranged hearts on a seemingly ordinary afternoon amidst the sanctuary of memories and melancholy that was his home mark embarked on a quest not unlike those of the great explorers of yore his mission to tidy the remnants of a life shared a life momentarily paused as he sifted through the books a testament to jane's insatiable appetite for knowledge a sliver of paper picked out a beacon in the dim light of his study with the precision of a surgeon and the curiosity of a child mark retrieved the sliver a phone number scribbled in ist an artifact of communication long forgotten chris number he whispered to himself the realization downing like the first light of dawn after a long dark night this was not just any number it was the rosetta stone to reconnecting with jane a lifeline thrown across the chasm of silence they had both resigned themselves to the moment was electric charged with potential max art a steffas drummer picked up pace echoing through the quiet room here was hope scribbled on the back of a book a book that smelled of jane of home thank you jesus mark breathe out a prayer of gratitude to the heavens to the forces that conspire to bring him this shred of hope clutching the book now a treasure chest of possibility mark allowed himself to dream to believe in second chances with the ancient phone number in hand a relic of a bygone era when jane was but a whisper away Mark stilled himself for the plunge into the icy waters of communication. The phone, an unassuming piece of technology, suddenly felt like a talisman capable of conjuring spirits from the past or, in this case, the voice of Chris, the gatekeeper to Jane's new world. Dialing the number was akin to a novice magician casting his first spell. Each ring an echo in the cavernous void between hope and reality. I, Chris, Mark ventured, his voice a cocktail of apprehension and forced cheerfulness. As if those three words could bridge years of silence, Chris's response was as warm as a snowflake. Yes, with this, an iceberg in the sea of Mark's expectations, 
Identifying himself, Mark felt like a traveler announcing his arrival at the gates of a foreign land, unsure of the welcome that awaited. The conversation that followed was a dance on a tight rope. Mark, the tight rope walker, tittered between pleading for a lifeline and maintaining the dignity of a man who had once thrown it all away. Chris, the skeptical audience, volleyed back with reminders of the past, his words sharp as shards of ice cutting into Mark's veneer of optimism. Please, Chris, I am really sorry. I know I made a mistake. Please forgive me. Mark implored, his plea floating across the wire, a leaf on the wind. Chris's admonition was swift, a reminder that forgiveness is not a commodity to be brokered over the phone. As the call concluded, Mark was left clutching the mobile phone, a lifeline that felt more like a mirage. Yet, within that conversation, leading with the frost of unresolved grievances and the faintest glimmer of hope, lay the possibility of towing the highs. For Mark, it was a beginning, however frigid, toward the warmth of reconciliation. Lucy's strategy for Mark's attention was less of a well-thought-out military campaign and more akin to a comedic skit. There she was, perched outside Mark's house like a cat waiting for the proverbial cream. Only a cream was a glimpse of Mark's daily life outside the corporate jungle. Dressed in what she deemed her most casual yet captivating attire, a blend of I just threw this on and meticulously planned for hours. Lucy's presence on Mark's front lawn was as inconspicuous as a peacock at a penguin party. Armed with nothing but her unwavering determination and a magazine she pretended to read upside down, Lucy's stakeout was less James Bond and more Inspector Gadget. Every passerby was a giving a nonchalant note. Her art of casual loitering as transparent as a freshly cleaned window. As the minutes ticked by, her imagination ran the world with scenarios of her and Mark's accidental meeting. Perhaps it would be charmed to her dedication or amused by her blattered disregard for social norms. In reality, the bushes she had hid behind offered little in terms of camouflage and much in terms of comedic relief for the neighborhood. When Mark finally appeared, the moment was nothing short of anticlimactic. Erased an eyebrow, the universal symbol of what on earth? And Lucy, flustered, launched into a spell about being in the neighborhood. Never mind that her neighborhood was miles away. Her attempt at serendipity was as graceful as a giraffe on ice skates. But in the grand tapestry of love and war, Lucy had choosing a battlefield. And on this battlefield, she stood ham with awkward enthusiasm and the hope that love, at least a date, might just conquer all. In a quiet corner of Jane's current abode, the living room where tranquility typically reigned, an unexpected disturbance came in in the form of her brother, Chris, who sauntered in with the subtlety of a marching band. Your husband called, he announced, 
dropping the news like a hot potato into Jane's lap as she sipped her tea, the epitome of calm amidst the storm brewing. Husband, which husband? Jane retorted, her eyebrows aching in the perfect mimicry of the gateway arc. The disbelief in her voice could have powered a small village. Chris, undeterred by her skepticism, plowed ahead, a man on a mission to deliver uncomfortable truth. Mark your husband, he clarified, as if naming the ghost from Jane's past would somehow make the situation less spectral. Jane's response was a blend of sarcasm and genuine curiosity, a cocktail she had perfected over years of dealing with unwelcome surprises. As Chris relayed Mark's message, a plea for communication and forgiveness, Jane's reaction was a masterclass in incredulity. Is it dreamy or what? She scoffed. The idea of reconciling with Mark as far-fetched as finding a unicorn in a backyard. Yet, as Chris spoke, the undercurrent of emotion was palpable. Mark's attempt to reach out, clumsy as it might have been, signaled a shift, a crack in the icy facade of their separation. Jane's dismissive quips could not fully mark the intrigue that flickered in her eyes, a sign that despite her protest, the past was not as neatly packed away as she would like. In this unexpected exchange, the seeds of doubt and curiosity were sown, watered by Chris's well-meaning but meddling delivery. As Jane navigated her brother's revelations, her fortified heart began to show signs of wear, hinting that perhaps, just perhaps, the door to the past was not as bolted shut as she had believed. In the grand theater of office politics, where whispers travel faster than emails, the sighting of Lucy and Mark's car set off a box akin to that of a hive disturbed. The office, unusually a place of monotonous tranquility, transformed into a bustling marketplace of rumors and speculation. Ben, ever the observer, found himself inadvertently cast as a town crier. The bearing news that Lucy, the enigmatic new secretary, had seemingly breached the final frontier. Max personal space. Did you see Lucy in Max's car? Became the question to Joe. Whispered across cubicles and passed along with the zeal of a hot stock tip. Each iteration of the story grew more elaborate, with Lucy and Mark battling stormy weathers, rescuing kittens from trees and engaging in clandestine meetings, all figments of the collective imagination, fueled by boredom and the human penchant for storytelling. Ben, watching the rumor mill churn with a mix of amusement and concern, couldn't help but marvel at the efficiency of the office's grapevine. It was a living, breathing entity that thrived on half-truths and speculation, a testament to the social dynamics that underpinned corporate life. In this environment, where fact and fiction blended seamlessly, the truth about Lucy's awkward car ride with Mark was lost, transformed into office law. And as the sun set on another day of productivity, 
the office stood united in anticipation of the next chapter of this unintentional soap opera, proving once again that when it comes to entertainment, nothing beats the dramas unfolding right at our desk. In the grand saga of Mark and Lucy's inadvertently public spectacle, the stage was set for a scene so cringe-worthy it could only be described as a masterclass in awkward timing. Lucy with a finesse of a bull in a china shop decided that the opportune moment to inch closer to Mark was precisely when the entire office seemed to be passing by his open office door. With a move that she hoped was subtle, but was as subtle as a fireworks display, Lucy attempted to accidentally brush some imaginary dust of Mark's soldier. Her approach was like that of a novice dancer attempting a tango, eager but painfully out of step. Mark, on the other hand, recoiled with the grace of a statued cat, eyes wide as saucers, looking around to see if this breach of personal space had witnesses. The timing, of course, was impeccable. Just as Lucy's hand made its clumsy descent, a group of colleagues walked by, their expressions morphing from casual interest to wide-eyed disbelief in the span of a heartbeat. In that moment, the office air became thick with unspoken questions and stifled chuckles. Later, as tales of the indecent traveled through the office at the speed of light, embellishments were added. Some say Mark leaped three feet in the hair, others swear Lucy was performing an ancient dust remover ritual. The truth, however, was much simpler and infinitely more embarrassing. Thus, the saga of Mark and Lucy was etched into office folklore, a cautionary tale of misread singers and the perils of poorly timed advances. In the end, it wasn't just the dust that was unsettled, but the very foundations of office decorum, leaving everyone with a story they will retell at every office gathering for years to come. Jane's return to the house where a mother lives was nothing short of a cinematic masterpiece, complete with the slow motion effect. As she stepped into the colorful living room, she saw a mom who quickly ran to her with joy. They embraced themselves for a long while. Jane asked of her children and learned that they are doing well. Her mom prepared her best meal for her and she ate with joy and satisfaction. Jane's homecoming was a delicate dance of reconnecting with her roots while navigating the new boundaries of her independence. It was a testament to the enduring pool of home, a place where at beats find their rhythm and lost souls find their way back step by tentative step. Mark's car ride with Lucy, the office's latest enigma, transformed an ordinary commute into an expedition through the land of awkward silences and strained conversation. Picture this. A car, the unsuspecting vessel for this journey, with Mark at the helm, navigating not just the roads but the choppy waters of office dynamics, 
made manifest in the passenger seat. Lucy, armed with the optimism of a lottery player and the planning of someone who had only ever seen cars in movies, decided this was a moment, a strategy, a conversation so filled with forced casualness it could have been sponsored by the world. So, nice weather we are having, isn't it? She ventured, her voice a pitch higher than intended, the question hanging in the hair like a balloon waiting to be popped. Mark caught in the driver's seat, what literally and metamorphically mustered a response that was as enthusiastic as a rain cloud. Ooh, yes, typical for this time of year. As they progressed, every traffic light became a beacon of hope for Lucy to launch another conversational lifeline only for it to sink like a stone in the ocean of max monosyllabic responses. So, you enjoy working at the company? She tried again, the desperation thinly veiled. Mark, sensing the growing discomfort like a storm on the rising, offered a smile that was meant to be reassuring but probably landed somewhere between puzzled and pained. It's been an interesting journey, he replied, a safe comment that traveled the middle road of ambiguity. The silence that followed was not golden. It was a kind of silence that had wit pressing down on the occupants of the car with the subtlety of a sitcom love track, loud, obvious, and slightly out of place. By the time Lucy's drop-off point mercifully arrived, both passengers were relieved, the hair in the car lighter as if they had both been holding their breath. Lucy, ever the optimist, thanked Mark with a cheerfulness that bellied the awkwardness of the ride. Mark, for his part, offered a farewell that was equal parts polite and relieved. As the car pulled away, the episode closed on what could only be described as the most awkward ride ever. A journey marked not by distance, but by the vast expanse between intention and outcome. A reminder of the complexities of human interaction in the confined space of a vehicle. In the quiet sanctuary of a room, where the walls edged secrets and the window whispered tales of the wind, Jane found herself in a battle as ancient as time itself, the war between heart and mind. With the moon as her only witness, she paced the length of her room, each step a question, each pause a sigh of indecision. Mark, she murmured, the name tasting of both sweet past and bitter present. A heart a seasoned soldier in the wars of love beat a rhythm of longing and loss. It sang of days drenched in laughter and nights wrapped in a warmth. Yet the mind ever the strategist raised walls of caution. Its memories etched with those scars of words unsaid and actions undone. The dance of contemplation was interrupted by the sudden appearance of a reflection in the mirror. Staring back was a woman caught in the twilight of what was and the dawn of what might be. 
can love truly be reborn from the ashes of its own demise? She whispered to her mirrored self, seeking counsel from the only one who knew about us. Her heart whispered of forgiveness, of the ember of love that refused to be extinguished. Her mind cautioned patience, reminding her of the journey from art to healing. In this moment, Jane was every lover who ever stood at the crossroad of reconciliation, weighing the scales of past pain against the promise of new beginnings. With a deep breath that felt like the first step of a thousand mile journey, Jane made a decision. The path ahead was uncertain, the outcome unknown, but the courage to choose love, to believe in the possibility of us again, was a testament to the enduring power of the human heart. And so, under the watchful eye of the moon, Jane's story unfolded a tale of love, resilience, and the eternal hope for a second chance. Mark, now a seasoned veteran of late night soliloquies to the heavens, found himself once more in the dim glow of his bedroom. The stage set for another heart to heart with the cosmos. This time, his approach was less of a formal petition and more of a casual chat with an old friend, albeit one who could potentially alter the course of his love life. All right, Mark started shifting uncomfortably on his knees as if trying the right posture for prayer, as if such a thing existed. Here we are again. The words felt strange in the quiet of his room, like he was about to negotiate a business deal rather than bear his soul. He chuckled to himself, imagining the Almighty with a celestial clipboard, marking his progress. So, I may have been a bit hasty last time, he admitted, speaking into the void with the earnestness of a man who had nothing left to lose but his pride. Mark recounted his tale of woe and redemption not omitting the part where he clumsily attempted to navigate the choppy waters of reconciliation, only to find himself adrift. I sent her away. And now, well, I'm asking for a do-over. He confessed the words hanging in the hair like a plea for clemency. As he continued, his prayer took on a rhythm, a back and forth between man and the divine, peppered with hopes, fears, and the occasional request for a sign, any sign, that he was not just talking to the ceiling. And um, if you could maybe nudge a heart a bit, nothing drastic, just a gentle divine poke. He added the corners of his mouth, twitching into a hopeful smile. By the time he concluded his prayers, Mark felt a sense of peace, a quiet assurance that while the road ahead was uncertain, he wasn't walking it alone. Rising from his knees, he cast a glance toward the heavens or the ceiling offering a silent thank you before turning off the lamp. In the darkness, Mark realized that his second attempt at prayer was not just a request for intervention, but an acknowledgement of his own journey toward becoming a better man. And with that realization, he drifted off to sleep 
the words of his prayer a lullaby to his troubled heart. Lucy's audacious maneuver at Mark's house was the stuff of legends, or at least it would be in the annals of office gossip. Picture this, a bright sunny afternoon, the hair filled with the promise of awkward encounters, and Lucy, our intrepid heroine, deciding that fortune favors the bold, or in a case, the recklessly daring. With the subtlety of a neon sign in the dead of night, Lucy positioned herself in Mark's living space, ready to enact what she believed to be the most foolproof plan to win his heart. In her mind, she was a leading lady in a romantic comedy, poised for the grand gesture that would sweep Mark off his feet. Reality, however, had a different script in mind. As Mark entered the room, the stage was set. Lucy, channeling what she assumed to be the essence of sultry charm, leaned in with the intent of a Hollywood kiss. Her eyes closed, lips puckered, and arms reaching for an embrace that would seal their fate. Mark, however, looked as if he had just walked into a surprise intervention. His expression, a mix of confusion and mild horror, could have served as a master class in discomfort. The hair between them crackled, not with romantic tension, but with the impending doom of a plan gone spectacularly awry. Just as Lucy's lips were about to land on their own intended target, the universe intervened in the form of a strategically placed Ottoman. With the grace of a swan taking its first clumsy steps, Lucy tripped, a grand gesture devolving into a fleeing attempt to preserve dignity. The room, once a battlefield of romantic aspirations, was now the scene of Lucy's folly, a comedy of errors that would be whispered about with a mix of disbelief and amusement. As Lucy righted herself, her cheeks burning with the fire of a thousand suns, it was clear that a bold strategy had not only missed its mark, but had also ensured her place in the Hall of Fame of misguided romantic gestures. And so, as the dust settled on this ill-fated encounter, Lucy and Mark were left to navigate the aftermath of a moment that was equal part cringe-worthy and unforgettable. The path to love, it seemed, was fraught with more than just a take. It was littered with the wreckage of well-intentioned plans gone spectacularly wrong. In the wake of Lucy's comedic misfire, Mark found himself on a quest to mend fences, or more aptly, to rebuild the bridge that Lucy's antics at all but obliterated. Armed with nothing but his wits and a heart full of earnestness, Mark approached Jane with the determination of a knight errant, albeit one battling dragons of his own making. Under the soft luminescence of the moon, which seemed to cast a spotlight on his moment of truth, Mark launched into a soliloquy that Shakespeare would have envied. Jane, he began, his voice trembling like a leaf in a tempest. I have been a fool, a monumental fool. He paced, 
each step a bit in the rhythm of his confession. I sent my wife away over shadows and whispers. He continued, gesturing wildly to the heavens as if to implicate the stars as co-conspirators in his folly. Jane, ever the statue of grace under pressure, watched with a mixture of skepticism and a flicker of amusement. Mark's performance was nothing short of ulcer-worthy, complete with dramatic pauses and the kind of hand-wringing usually reserved for daytime soap operas. I beg of you, Jane, to consider a truce, to reopen the embassy of your heart, Mark pleaded, his metaphor missing, reaching new heights of desperation. Let me be the ambassador of my own repentance. As his declaration reached its crescendo, Mark knelt, not unlike a subject before royalty. His gaze locked on Jane's. The hair between them was electric, charged with the anticipation of a verdict. In that moment, Mark was not just a man seeking forgiveness. He was a bird, his life a tapestry of errors and lessons, his love story a sonnet waiting for its final couplet. And as Jane contemplated her response, the night held its breath. The cosmos itself a witness to the power of love, redemption, and the occasional bout of dramatic flair. In the aftermath of lucid debacle, Mark found himself navigating the treacherous waters of a conversation with Jane about the future, a future he hoped would still include the two of them. The setting was Jane's living room, a neutral territory filled with the ghosts of their shared past, and now possibly the birthplace of their future. Jane, with the poise of a queen holding court, laid out at times with the precision of a diplomat. Mark, she began a voice steady. If we are going to try this again, there are going to be some ground rules. Mark nodded, his attention riveted on her, aware that the faith of his marital bliss was being decided. First, Jane continued, ticking off on her fingers as if she were outlining the terms of a peace treaty. You need to trust me more. You need to allow me to be me. In lieu of this, no more monitoring my movement. I will walk wherever I want and wear whatever I want. So far, it is decent. Mark's agreement was immediate, a not so vigorous, it threatened to dislodge his sense of balance. Second, we need to communicate better. I am talking full sentences, deep conversations, and yes, even arguing when we need to. You have to stop do the domineering and insecure attitude. Mark found himself oddly energized by the prospect, a verbal marathon runner ready at the starting line. And third, Jane concluded, a gaze locking with ease, no jealousy of any kind, even if you see me with a man in a car. I always tell you that I made the decision to marry you on our wedding day reciting the vows. So, be confident that no man will take me away from you. The weight of her words hung in the hair, 
a challenge and a promise rolled into one. Mark, feeling like he had just been given the map to a treasure he had long thought lost, agreed to each condition with a vavor that surprised even him. Jane, I am all in. Whatever it takes, he affirmed his voice ringing with sincerity. And as they shook on it, the living room no longer felt like a room filled with ghosts, but rather a stage set for a new beginning. With Jane's conditions laid out like the foundation of a new beginning, they both stepped into a tentative truce, hopeful for what the future might bring. This was no mere negotiation. It was a laying down of arms after a long battle, the first step on the road to rediscovery and perhaps a love renewed. In what could only be described as a scene straight out of a Wild West showdown, Mark found himself facing off against Lucy, the not-so-secret admirer whose recent antics had catapulted her into the realm of office folklore. The setting was the office, transformed for the moment into a battleground where the lines between professional decorum and personal drama blurred. As Mark approached Lucy, who stood defiantly by the water cooler, the tension in the hair was palpable. Colleagues peeked over the cubicle walls, their eyes wide with anticipation as if they were spectators at a tennis match, waiting to see the ball fly. Lucy, Mark began, his voice steady but laced with a firmness that brooked no argument. We need to talk. Lucy tilting her head with a confidence that bellied her situation, nodded. I am all ears, she responded, her tone a mix of defiance and curiosity. The conversation that ensued was less a dialogue and more a verbal dance, with Mark leading. Your enthusiasm, Mark? choose his words with the care of a bomb diffuser expert has not gone unnoticed but it's caused more than a few complications lucy undeterred tried to interject with a blend of excuses and explanations each more outlandish than the last from accidental encounters that were anything but accidental to misunderstood gestures that no one could possibly misunderstand, her de defense was a masterclass in creative reasoning. Mark, however, was unmovable. I appreciate your dedication, he said, the pause filled with a diplomacy he barely felt, but it is time we part ways, professionally speaking. The silence that followed was heavy, filled with the unspoken words and what-ifs that lingered in the hair like smoke after a fire. Lucy, a arsenal of explanations exhausted, nodded, understood. She said, a voice a whisper of its formal defiance. As she walked away, the office collectively exhaled, the drama concluding with an anticlimax that left everyone slightly disappointed yet relieved. Mark watched her go, the weight of the confrontation settling on his soldiers like a mantle. He hadn't wanted it to come to this, but the lines had been drawn, the duel fought, and the saga of Lucy, the office would be romantic heroine, had come to an end. In the end, 
the showdown with Lucy was less about victors and vanquished and more a reminder of the fine line between affection and obsession, a cautionary tale that will be whispered about in office corridors for years to come. In the quiet aftermath of Lucy's comic misstep and Jane's declaration of conditions, Mark found himself on the precipice of the ultimate romantic gesture. This was his last stand, his final play in the game of love, a game he would inadvertently turn into a roller coaster ride of emotions. With the determination of a man on a mission, Mark planned a rendezvous that was part Romeo, part modern day night. The setting, the very spot where he and Jane had first confessed their love under the stars, a place untouched by the complexities of their recent past. It was here, under the same constellations, that had once witnessed the birth of their love, that Mark decided to lay it all on the line. Armed with nothing but his hat on his sleeve and a booklet of Jane's favorite flowers, peonies, symbols of love and honor, he rehearsed his speech. Words, however, seemed too feeble to capture the enormity of his feelings. This was more than an apology. It was an ode to their shared history, a pledge for their future. As Jane arrived, the hair between them crackled with anticipation. Mark, usually so composed, found himself stumbling over his rehearsed lines, his emotions rendering him as eloquent as a teenager on his first date. Jane, I, mm, the thing is, I, he started, his heart beating a frantic tattoo against his ribs. Jane, for her part, listened with a patience born of understanding a high softening at Mark's visible struggle. It was in this moment, amidst the stumbles and the nervous laughter, that the raw sincerity of Mark's plea shone through. I can't promise perfection, he finally managed, but I can promise every piece of my heart for every day we have together. I am asking for another chance to make us right. The silence that followed was profound, filled with the weight of decisions yet to be made and words yet to be spoken. As they stood there, two souls at a crossroads, the night air seemed to hold its breath, waiting for Jane's response. In this scene, Mark's last stand was not marked by grand declarations or cinematic gestures. Instead, it was defined by the simple, unvarnished truth of his feelings, a testament to the power of love in its most authentic form. Post Mark's heartfelt outpour, Jane found herself in the cozy embrace of her favorite armchair, a fortress of solitude amidst the chaos of emotions swelling within. The room, bath in the soft glow of the table lamp, seemed to hold its breath, echoing Jane's inner tumor. It was here, in the quiet of the night, that she embarked on a journey inward, navigating the tumultuous seas of her heart and mind. With Mark's earnest words echoing like a haunting melody, Jane sifted through the memories, each a mosaic piece of their shared past. The laughter that filled their home, the gentle touches, 
the shared drains, it all came flooding back, painting a picture of what was and what could still be. Yet, shadows of doubt locked in the corners, whispering reminders of the pain and the rift that had grown between them. Hammed with a cup of tea, a lawyer companion through countless nights of contemplation, Jane weighed Max plea against the fortress of walls she had built around her heart. Can broken trust be mended? Can love truly outshine the remnants of heart? She pondered, a heart a battlefield of hope and hesitation. As the clock ticked on, marking the passage of time and the depth of her reflections, a realization dawned upon her, a revelation wrapped in the simplicity of understanding. Love, in its essence, was not about the absence of laws, but the grace of forgiveness. The courage to face the storm together and the resilience to rebuild from the ashes of past mistakes. With a sigh that felt like the release of a thousand spo unspoken words, Jane acknowledged the ember of love that refused to be extinguished, its warmth gently coercing her walls to crumble. In this moment of re revelations, the decision that once seemed an insurmountable peak now appeared as a bridge to a new beginning, a path towards healing and perhaps a second chance at love. And so, with the dawn of a new day peeking through the curtains, Jane's journey of reflection culminated in a quiet resolve, a readiness to embrace the vulnerabilities and imperfections of love, armed with the wisdom of the night's revelations. In the warm glow of the morning sun, which seemed to cast a hopeful light over everything it touched, Jane found herself at a crossroad that felt both daunting and exhilarating. The hair was filled with the scent of new beginnings and the faint aroma of Max Peonis, a lingering reminder of his heartfelt plea. As she sipped her coffee, the steam swelling up like the myriad thoughts racing through her mind. Jane couldn't help but smile at the irony of it all. Here she was, contemplating a future she had sworn was left in the past. Bored by the earnestness in Mark's eyes and the stammer in his voice, it was as if those peonies had not just perfumed a living room, but also in some inexplicable way, a heart. The decision to step back into the dance of their relationship with its familiar rhythm and newfound steps felt like jumping without a parachute. Yet, there was something thrilling about the free fall, about choosing to trust in the parachute of their love to open in time. With a deep breath that felt like the first page of a new chapter, Jane made a choice. She would take the leap of faith, not because of grand gestures or flowery promises, but because of the small undeniable flicker of hope that whispered of what could be. Picking up her phone, she dialed Mark's number, each ring pulsating with the weight of her decision. Mark, it's me, she said, her voice steady and sure. Let's try again, for real this time, but Let's take it slow, one step at a time. 
the relief and joy in Mark's response were palpable, even through the phone line. It was a moment of pure, unfiltered connection, the void of the complications that had once ensnared them. As Jane hung up the phone, a sense of peace enveloped her. The future was uncertain, the path ahead uncharted. But for the first time in a long while, she felt ready to navigate it with Mark by her side. And so, with the morning sun as her witness, Jane embarked on this new journey, a leap of faith into the arms of love and forgiveness. Her heart bowed by the simple yet profound belief in second chances. In the gentle embrace of twilight, as the world around them transitioned from the vivid hues of day to the soft palette of evening, Mark and Jane found themselves side by side once more. This wasn't just any meeting, it was a culmination of journeys both personal and shared, a testament to the resilience of the human heart. With the backdrop of their favorite park, where nature itself seemed to celebrate their reunion with a symphony of evening sounds, they walked. No grand declarations were made, no promises of eternal bliss spoken, just the comfortable silence of two souls in sync, a harmony long missed. As they found their way to the old bench that had borne witness to the spectrum of their relationship, from the first flush of love to the painting of parting, it was as if the universe itself conspired to wrap them in a the cocoon of serenity. Sitting side by side, their fingers tentatively intertwined, a rush of emotions flooded them. It was a simple gesture, yet it spoke volumes, bridging the gap that words could not fill. In this moment, illuminated by the soft glow of the setting sun, their laughter mingled with the breeze, light and carefree. It was a laughter of healing, of the shared joy that comes from overcoming from knowing that they had weathered the storm and emerged, not unscathed, but stronger. The park, with its whispered secrets and memories etched into every tree and pathway, served as a perfect witness to their triumph. Their triumph of love over doubt, of forgiveness over resentment, of hope over despair. As the evening drew to a close and the stars began to claim their places in the night sky, Mark and Jane stood, a silent vow passing between them. This was not the end of their story, but a new beginning, a second chance granted not just by fate, but forged through the fire of their trials. And so, under the canopy of the night, they step forward together, their hearts light with the promise of tomorrow, secure in the knowledge that whatever challenges lay ahead, they would face them united. For in the end, it was love, imperfect, enduring, and beautifully human that triumphed, a beacon guiding them home. After their heartfelt reunion, Mark and Jane found themselves not just navigating the waters of rekindled love, but also the bustling on the currents of their friends and families who, it turned out, were more than ready to play 
their part in this love story's next chapter. It began with Ben, ever the orchestrator of mischief and merriment, who decided that such a momentous reunion deserved celebration. Not just any celebration, though a surprise party that would bring together the cast of characters who had been part of Mark and Jane's journey. The plan was simple yet ambitious. The venue, their favorite local restaurant, commandeered for the evening under the guise of a routine dinner out. The conspirators, a motley crew of friends, family, and a few unwitting co-workers roped into the scheme. As Mark and Jane enter the restaurant, expecting nothing more than a quiet meal, they were met with a chorus of cheers, a flurry of confetti, and the warm embrace of their loved ones. The look of utter surprise on their faces was priceless. A mixture of shock and delight that would be talked about for years. There, amidst the laughter, the shared stories, and the clinking of glasses, Mark and Jane realized that their love story was far bigger than just the two of them. It was woven into the lives of all those present a tapestry of connections that had supported, challenged, and ultimately celebrated them through thick and thin. As the evening wore on, filled with dancing, toast, and perhaps a few embarrassing stories retold with great relish, the couple found themselves surrounded not just by the people they loved, or by a sense of belonging and community. It was a reminder that no matter the trials they had faced, they had never been alone. So, as they took to the dance floor, swaying to their song under the soft glow of the fairy lights, Mark and Jane shared a look of profound gratitude. This was more than a celebration, it was a reaffirmation of their journey, a joyous conspiracy of love that had brought them back together and showed them the beauty of starting anew together. And in that moment, with the music enveloping them and the future stretching out, bright and inviting, they knew that this was just the beginning of a new wonderful chapter, one filled with laughter, love, and the occasional surprise party.